Welcome to the Smart Divorce on Divorce Source Radio. Helping you move forward with focus, hope, and confidence. Saving you time, money, and your sanity as you build a better life post-divorce. I'm Steve Peck. Deborah Moscovich, divorce consultant, educator, and author of The Smart Divorce, brings you the leading experts and researchers in the divorce arena. We'll also be speaking with those in the trenches, people who've learned from their divorce and how their experience has changed their lives. And they would tell you for the better. Deborah's learned that divorce can be a beginning, even if it looks like an end. Divorce can be rich in opportunity to learn and grow from. And we're going to explore how to take this information and create a positive post-divorce life. And now, here's Deborah. Hi, Steve. How are you today? Hey, I'm great, Deborah. How are you? I'm just wonderful. And we've got a great show planned. We're talking about mediation. Hmm. Now, I know we've covered mediation before, and we know what a mediator, mediator does, mm-hmm. and neutral third party, and you know all that goes along with it, where the couple has the opportunity to build their own solution. But our guest today, Kara Raish, she's a mediator and attorney who specializes in helping people find non-adversarial effective resolutions to conflict. She's a founding partner at Stadler Raich, but what I like about Kara is she really looks at things from a different perspective. So this isn't going to be your old typical mediator show about what the mediator can and can't do and doesn't act as the lawyer and all, you know give you legal advice, but really talk about the mechanics of mediation mm-hmm. and different perspectives. I mean, there's so many things that we need to think about that really aren't discussed all that often, if yeah. ever. And that's what Kara's going to do with us today is really enlighten us about mediation. I'm so excited to have her. She's a president of the Family and Divorce Mediation Council of Greater New York. So who better than someone who's well-versed in mediation to explain all what's going on? And I think mediation is catching on more. It used to be people always thought about litigation. Now mediation is becoming quite popular, quite well-known, and uh, as is collaborative, maybe to a lesser degree. But let's find out more about it. Kara Rach, welcome to The Smart Divorce on Divorce Horse Radio. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here. So, you know, like we think of mediation as the couple having the opportunity to create their own solutions. But how do they know what that solution should be when they don't know what the parameters are and, and what mediation really is all about? Um, I think it's really important that the the roles of the, both the mediator and the couple in the mediation get talked about in advance of um, beginning the conversation about, for example, the two main topics in divorce are money and children. Um, before getting into the specifics of the conversation, it's really important to delineate the working relationship between the mediator and the couple. And we call that in our world contracting, but that stage of contracting of of delineating the expectations of the parties in mediation, which is the couple and the role of the mediator and making that extremely clear in advance is very important. Um, In my view, the role of the mediator is to be in charge of two things. One is the process, the how we're going to work together, how we're going to talk about what we're going to talk about, but also um, to ensure that the couple is making informed decisions and How they make informed decisions is is part of, you know, what mediation brings to the table in divorce. But ensuring that informed decisions are made is definitely the responsibility, in my view, of the mediator. Okay, well, that's interesting that you say that because as a mediator, you are a neutral third party. You can't really offer advice. You can't tell them what they should be doing. So how how do you help inform them then? Um, So there's a number of different ways that we do this. One is to ensure that the couple um, is making intentional decisions. So, for example, we want to make sure if it's a... um, If it's a financial decision, we have a list of topics that's probably 100 topics long of angles and different things that a couple would need to address. But also we would say, what matrices are you using, couple, to make the decision that you're making? There's legal uh, standards that you might be using. There's uh, your own sense of personal fairness, what's important to you, husband, and what's important to you, wife. And those might be different, and that's okay. 
Uh, but we'd want that to be in the room with us. We would want to look at whether agreements had been made either prior to the marriage between the couple or during the marriage that would inform how decisions are going to get made in the divorce. Um, but in terms of giving advice, no, I'm not going to say to somebody, you know, I really think it's in your best interest to have X amount in spousal support. But what I might say is, if you're deciding on this number, can you explain to me how that works for you? Why does it work? What, you know, we would say to a couple, um, let's fill out some budget sheets and let's see how you're both going to live. And let's what we would call reality test the agreement that people are coming to to make sure that it's going to work for them today, tomorrow. And these agreements have to last for a very long time. And to make sure that it's realistic going into the future. And more than that, making sure that there are dispute resolution mechanisms in those agreements to facilitate success long term. So do you find that there's a difference in perspective? Like people have an outlook what they're entitled to, but then, you know, there's what they really do need. So do you help them see that although they might be entitled to X, what they need is Y, so there's got to be the balance between those two? So you've identified one of the key distinctions between mediation and litigation. Um, A litigation is a rights-based conversation. Right. What am I entitled to? What are you entitled to? In mediation, we have a needs and interest-based conversation, which is a little bit different. So part of the what am I entitled to question for me is not just what am I entitled to if I were in a different process, in a litigation, where a judge was making a decision. It's also and how much would it cost to get that entitlement in emotional fallout, in time, in money, um, so that the when I talked about informed decision making, what I mean is to also be informed about what would have to happen to achieve what your attorney predicts you might be entitled to if you were in a different process. And that's part of informed legal decision making when you're in a mediative process. But the needs and interest component is more important in many ways in mediation. And we have a conversation about what people's needs are, what their expectations are. Um, and what their interests are and why it is. If somebody says, I want X, I want to know why they want X. Why is that important to them? Why do they feel like it's fair if they get that? And if they do get that, then they end up, uh, then the other party maybe will walk away less angry because even though they gave up something, there's an understanding why they gave up that, you know, the additional. Theoretically. And that's why, you know, we could have a very detailed conversation about what I think the appropriate role of the law and mediation is. But I think part of making an informed decision is being able to say to your consulting lawyer in the process, you know, yes, I know that if we were down the street at the courthouse, I could have gotten X, whatever that is. But I gave that up. Theoretically speaking, I gave that up because it was important to my uh, ex-spouse for this reason. And if people can articulate those reasons, the agreements start to make more sense and people feel a sense of ownership and pride in the agreements that they make in mediation. A little bit of horse trading going on here. Um, A lot of divorce negotiation is tit for tat or horse trading, as you say, but my intention as a mediator would be that the horse trading that happens is intentional and it isn't reflexive. Are all these mediation sessions attended by the litigant's attorney? Because in Uh, my mediation, my attorney, he kind of said, so long, you're on your own. My job is done. You you asked a very complicated question because what you're really asking is, I think, is what is the role of the attorney in a mediation, or at least the way I practice mediation? And you referred to the participants as litigants in my practice. The participants are not litigants. Um, They have not filed for divorce. They are coming to have a mediative solution, so we would refer to them as parties. The parties to the mediation will come to our offices, um, both the husband and the wife, together. Um, And we absolutely insist that all of our clients have what we call consulting attorneys. Those Those consulting attorneys are typically not in the room, um, but they have a very particular role. And Part of why we we think we're good at our job is because we talk about the role of the law and the role of lawyers as advisors in this process in a very intentional and particular way so that the expectations of the role of the law is clear to everybody who's participating. See, I like the way you think. It's, you're trying to get a societal shift in thinking. And you accomplished that very well in your blog 
Mediatrix, which I thought is has great articles, and I really urge our listeners to listen. We'll have a link to that um, on, on our Thank site. You. One of the things that you talk about, so if I could just change up the title, a little, uh, the topic a little bit, is the financial settlement and parenting. Can you explain that a little bit more? Sure. It's the relationship between financial settlement and parenting. And parenting. So yeah. there's two main topics in divorce when people are divorcing with children, money and kids. And the way both the law and our cultural perceptions about what ought to happen in a divorce separate the money and the kids. And in my experience, um, the two are intricately linked because in order to be co-parents, which most of my clients are trying to be co-parents, you need to be able to live and to be able to provide for the children. Now, the trick in all of this is that if one person resents writing a check and another person resents receiving a check, that's going to create a certain amount of animosity between ex-spouses and co-parents. And what we know from our therapist and psychologic uh, mental health colleagues is that children know inherently they are half their mother and half their father. And if one of those two people is a bad person, um, then they know that part of them's a bad person too. And that's how they internalize the conflict between their parents. And so if we can create an environment where we're encouraging parents to come up with a financial settlement that makes sense for both of them, maybe that they're not thrilled with, because frankly, divorce is always financially very challenging, but a divorce, a financial settlement that makes sense to them, then we can create more harmonious co-parenting. And we know that high conflict co-parents is emotionally damaging to children. The lower the conflict between their parents, the better they do long term. And there's actually some psychological research to support that. So we think it's very important to connect those two topics, intrinsically connect them and not separate them the way the law has, because we don't think that's in the best interest of children. Yeah, that's a very good point. They do say that high conflict by far is the biggest determinator of how well children do post-divorce. So obviously, if there's a lot of conflict, children don't do as well as children who really see almost like little or no conflict. I mean, we have to be realistic about what's going on in a domestic situation where parents are electing to divorce. It's The transition period is probably fraught with conflict. The issue is how can we, by helping people have lower conflict divorce, it doesn't mean we think they're going to agree with each other more. It doesn't mean that we think they're not going to be in a fight with each other. But how to create communication systems between co-parents that will support as low conflict. And by low conflict, we mean where expectations will be set out, where the devil's in the details. By being really detailed in how we support co-parenting, so that it's better for the kids and the kids do better long term. And when we have a whole generation of people, more than one generation, of people who are products of high conflict divorces, and um, we can do better. We simply can do better. Is it easier on the kids if they're older when this process takes place? Um, You know, I'm not a therapist by profession, I'm a lawyer by profession, but I can tell you that in my experience, the age of the child doesn't matter as much as the methodology that the parents have engaged in in co-parenting that child. So um, if the parents are low conflict, whether the kids are young or old, doesn't seem to matter from a psychological research perspective. What seems to matter the most is the lower the conflict, the more safe the kids feel, because their foundation is their mother and their father. And if they know that their foundation, I mean, I'm speaking by, in fact, saying this, I'm sort of totally disregarding the fact that there are same-sex parents out there, and I, I would imagine the same holds true, but that the foundation is the mom and the dad. And um, if those foundations are solid and those foundations don't seem fragile to them, they feel a sense of uh, security that's really beneficial to them long term. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know what, Steve? Um, and I've read a lot and I follow a, a lot of articles on the impact of divorce on children. And whether a child is three or 30, their worldview of their parents' relationship has just been shaken to the core. So they really are affected. I think the difference is when you're young, you are living, the children of, the children are really living out the divorce. They are going from mom's house to dad's house. But for adult children to divorce, they're not schlepping back and forth. So that's, I think the difference, like emotionally, 
you know, their parents are separated. That's that's hard on anybody. But just you don't have the logistical but nightmare. If, but if they're older, they've been through some of their own relationship issues. It seems like they wouldn't, you know, look at it the same way a 10 year old would be that I'm half mom, I'm half dad. And if they're bad, I'm bad. It seems like they'd be able to have some more rationale at an older age. But then you have alignment issues. For instance, if there was infidelity and, you, like, you know, a, a 10-year-old isn't going to look at it the same way as a 20-year-old. But if mom had an affair or dad had an affair, all of a sudden the adult child wants to protect the parent who uh, was cheated on. So you, you've got those kind of differences? Mm -hmm. I think the That's bottom line in all of this, whether a child is an adult child or a teenage child or a very young child, from as a mediator, from my perspective, it's how it's, has the family been intentional about creating ways to spend time together, have created parameters so that those times together, the Thanksgivings, the high school graduations, the, all of those events can happen without high conflict and can happen in, with a sense of expectation about what's going to happen. Um, and, and that's really the root of what someone like me brings to a divorce is a sense of expectations being lined out, laid out in a way that makes sense to a particular family so that when those events come about, they aren't fraught with tension and conflict and discomfort. Right. And so as you, you know, while you're a neutral third party, you're also an educator. You want to help your the parties understand what the conflict means, you know, what the end result is going to be. So you want to diffuse that conflict. Um, yes. I mean, I think in divorce mediation, when I'm doing non-divorce mediation, I feel like my role is different. In a divorce mediation, the, the concept of neutrality, I think, needs to be fleshed out a lot more. We've been throwing around this term neutral a few times this morning, and I think that we can define that and flesh it out a little bit more. But um, my role is to provide information and to ensure informed decision making. And part of the informed decision making is bringing in information from different disciplines into the room. Okay. So do, you, do you want to define neutrality then? Well, some mediators, people have different perspectives and there's different theoretical underpinnings of mediation. Mine is one that I call active neutrality. I'm equally, on, I'm equally close to husband and I'm equally close to wife. And active neutrality means to ensure that if there's a, uh, a for example, a, an information deficit from one person to the other, for example, if one person doesn't understand the family finances as well as the other, part of my job as a neutral facilitator is to make sure that the person who isn't as versed in the financial information gets the support that they need to make the conversation an equal, to have both people on equal footing. So passive neutrality, I'm not just going to let things happen. I have a role and I, I have to um, participate and engage with both people in a meaningful way. Neutrality doesn't mean letting people talk about whatever they want to talk about and not engaging with them. It's equally engaging with both of them that makes a good neutral facilitator, in my opinion. Well, that's great. I think this information is really helpful for our listeners who I hope you can understand that not all mediators are created equal. So when you do your research, you need to look for someone like Kara because look at what you provide, look what you bring to the table for your clients, for the parties. When I went, through, when I went through my mediation, it was St. Patrick's Day and my <laughs> mediator had his shamrock tie on and we didn't have everything we needed to, to do this properly. We didn't have all the items and, and all of that. And he literally said to me, you know what? I'm supposed to be at the bar right now. Let's just put this stuff on in paper. We'll go back and forth, get this done. And we did. Uh, you know, I had not been through the house so I don't even remember. And I hadn't been in the house for over a year. So I really didn't remember what was there and I wanted to do a walkthrough or whatever. And he just talked us into putting everything down on paper. And after the fact, uh, I know there's so much stuff that wasn't listed and wasn't there. Um, also in our mediation, and I want to ask you about this for others, we were separated. We weren't at the same table. And I guess that's common for high conflict divorces. But uh, it was kind of an odd situation. It reminded me of a realtor that represents both buyer and seller where he was kind of manipulating both sides to get the deal done as quickly as possible. What do you think about that? I'm sure you can imagine that I have a reaction to what you said. Um, 
First of all, I'm sorry that you didn't have a good experience in mediation because every family that has a negative mediation experience is bad for the profession as a whole. Um, I am somewhat uh, upset to hear that anything was put down on a piece of paper prior to a really thoughtful examination of the issues um, present. Um, I'm incredibly shocked that somebody would have articulated their preference to be out drinking than assisting you when you were in a lot of pain and you needed a lot of help. And this guy was um, court appointed, right? So I didn't have a choice. Uh, so what you're referring to, oh, so court appointed mediation is actually a really interesting um, theoretical issue for mediators because one of the main um, um, tenets of mediation is voluntariness. And so there's a real question about for court mandated mediation, how do you achieve a sense of voluntariness so that people can have a free and open conversation? And one of the ways that we've thought about handling this is if you came to me, for example, with a court mandated mediation, I would say before anybody said anything else, I would say, give me the piece of paper. I'm going to sign it. Okay. I've signed it. Now let's talk about why it might make sense for the two of you to stay. And we would contract with those people to make sure that they understood what they were doing. And the goal, even if it's a court mandated mediation, and this is where I'm most troubled by your story, is the goal when somebody comes to see me, my agenda is understanding. Understanding what's important to you and understanding what's important to you. It sounds like the mediator in your particular case, at least from your perspective, had an agenda to get you to settle. And that's antithetical to the voluntary nature and theoretical underpinnings of mediation as far as I'm concerned. So I'm very troubled by your story on a number of different levels. Um, and to address the last point, which is you were not sitting together, um, you experienced what I like to call shuttle diplomacy mediation where one person is in one room, the other person's in the other room, and somebody goes back and forth to beat each person up to get you to settle, to yeah. achieve that agenda, which is settlement. Mm -hmm. So mediation has a, has a, has a spectrum. Um, on one end of the spectrum, there's evaluative, which is sort of what you've experienced. Listen, I've been doing this for 30 years, and I got to tell you, if you walk in the courtroom, this is what's going to happen. So that's, that's more evaluative. And then there's on the other end of the spectrum, facilitative, which is where um, you sort of create more voluntariness. And I, I practice something called the understanding-based model that was invented by um, some very wonderful uh, mediators, um, which, which really is somewhere in the middle of those two, which is where I take a lot of control about process and I spend time talking with people about the how of the what, how we're going to talk about what we're going to talk about. Um, but... When you take away, uh, when, when you put people in separate rooms, to me, in a divorce, that is completely antithetical to creating an environment where trust can exist, where it, how would it feel if you knew you were being spoken about behind your back and you're sitting in another room and you literally know that the, that the mediator who you're supposed to trust to be a neutral third party is in the other room talking about you behind your back. To me, that is completely antithetical to creating an environment where collaborative agreement making can happen. Yeah. But, but, so how, it's a how animal. but then how do you manage that when it's so, because we also caucused, like I was in one room, my a former husband was in the other, um, mm -hmm. when it's so high conflict and there's no trust and you, you can't even look at each other. Um, I can understand that, that especially when there's been a litig when there's been litigation, you have to remember that my clients are typically very self-selecting and they seek out mediation. When we engage in an extremely high conflict mediation or when people who have really suffered in litigation and have come to us because they're dissatisfied with litigation, we start those conversations where you can't even look at each other with a conversation about, uh, about risk, um, about the risks of a litigation, and the risks of failing at mediation. And we make very small agreements simply about risk. And then we create slowly agreements about how we're gonna to work together. We don't, the, the big mistake that some mediators make um, is to take high conflict people, put them together at the table, and then just start talking about the substance right away. It doesn't work. You have to create an environment with rules 
and guidelines and expectations that are articulated to facilitate a non-high conflict conversation. But it is unrealistic and it doesn't honor people where they're at when they're in a high conflict to sit them down and say, okay, so about the kids. That's not going to work. And that's not fair to those people. And also in our two rooms, in my room, I was alone. In my ex's room, she had family members and people that are on her side. So, and I can hear muffled conversation through the walls. I can't really make it out, but I'm not going to lie to you. I tried to hear it. You know, I don't blame you. And you don't take a knife to a gunfight. But, but yeah. I mean, this is this was a horrible feeling. I mean, it's my my mother in law and father in law and brother in law are in there, and it just was. Oh. I'm so glad oh, to hear how you operate, Kara, because this for our listeners, this is what you need to look for. Yeah, this is exactly, exactly what I was thinking of. And in terms of what you look for, though, I have a question for you. Like Steve's in the States. I'm in Canada. I mean, this is just the beauty of um, computer or technological age. And you grew up in Canada. And now you live in the U.S. How have you how do you see societal values and alternative dispute re- resolution uh, differ between countries? Because, well, you know, we've got listeners all over the world. Well, and so, states even, right? Yeah, yeah, we've got a couple in the States, a couple in Canada, a few more in the States. But seriously. Uh, so I think that's a really, I think part of the reason why I'm sitting here today talking to you and why I ended up on the path that I ended up on has a lot to do with the fact that I have a, com- a comparative perspective on the different systems of law. I went to law school in Canada um, and I practiced law in the United States as well and I ended up being very uh, dissatisfied with my career in civil litigation because I felt like America is simply, and this is a fact, it's not a value-based statement, it's a fact-based statement, America is more litigious as a society. And so a lot of decision-making in a lot of different areas, either uh, business or medicine, is rooted in a fear of litigation. And in Canada, the fear of litigation and the threat of litigation isn't as forward. And so as I tried to grow professionally, I came to see that there is so much space for ADR to grow, alternative dispute resolution, to grow in the United States. And then because mediation was so, I've always liked mediation. I took it in law school. I've always liked it. Um, Because mediation, especially in, is, is it more accepted in the family context? I ended up gravitating toward family and divorce mediation. And then I came to learn a lot about the law and how the law um, is a legal, is a rational instrument that's designed to deal with rational problems. And it really struck me very strongly that divorce is a family matter with a legal element. It's not a lawsuit that happens to be about a family. And my um, perspective is that the more we can do to help families deal with the family component and have a realistic expectation about the role the law ought to play in their divorce, the better off families will be and children will be and we as a society will be. So the the, the difference in the countries is that um, in Canada, divorce mediation isn't um, an alternative. It's something that people do when they're getting divorced. In Britain, people go to mediation before they file litigation. And in the U.S., people take out an index number and file a lawsuit. And, and I think that we can do better. But in Michigan, we're kind of shuttled through mediation prior to litigation. And 97%, I believe, of people settle in mediation. 97% of people will settle anyway. Because True. in the family law context, and in most contexts, cases are not decided by a judge. They're settled. So... What I would say is that there's a difference between being coerced to settle by the court and a quality, holistic approach to divorce that a mediation service like the one I provide offers. What happened to you based on your telling it is not mediation. It's forced settlement. Um, Waterboarding. That's not what I do. (laughs) Seemed Seemed like waterboarding to me. (laughs) <laughs> and I'm sure it did, yeah. because what happened to you, particularly with not even having the same people surrounding you, I, to me, that that is not how you treat people. And it engenders 
a tremendous amount of um, dissatisfaction afterwards mm -hmm. that is irreparable um, in many cases. So I think that courts need to be educated about different ways of providing mediation services that is a more non-legally oriented or solely legally oriented approach that, that to have a more open conversation about how what's happening in the lawsuit is going to affect the family as you know, a unit. You know, that's an excellent point because when you really think about divorce and we know how emotional it is and people have difficulty moving on because they haven't dealt with the reasons why the relationship didn't work. But then mm -hmm. to have a settlement forced down your throat that you really feel uncomfortable with, that you have to live for the rest of your life with, again, adds another layer of emotions and, and right. disappointments. And, and those are things that you have to really figure out too, that, oh my goodness, like you've got so many issues that you have to work through. It's, an, it's a wonder that so many people end up post-divorce sort of emotionally healthy. Yeah. <laughs> you know, when you, when you, <laughs> when you think physically. about all that. Yeah, or physically healthy, and we've talked a lot about that too. Mm -hmm. Carrie, you talked a lot about the role of law in divorce conversation and, you know, what that means. Can you just touch on a little bit more in terms of what people should think about? Yes, yes. This is something that I feel very passionately about. Um, I'm going to say a general statement and then I'll flush it out, which is the role of the law in a divorce can be as relevant, the law can be as relevant or as determinative as the couple themselves want it to be, which means that there's a choice. So I'll say a few things about the law in general and then the law as it, as it pertains to divorce. When you think about, if your listeners can take a moment and think about the first time they were introduced to the law, parents, teachers, the cops, depending on what kind of childhood they might have had. But when the law is introduced to a young person, it comes down with the force of a sledgehammer. It's the law. And um, when people walk into a divorce, oftentimes it's their first formal contact with the law. And they bring all of that, all of their um, thinking, well, I don't steal, I don't go through red lights, therefore I follow the law. But the challenge in, in, in a divorce context is, is that the law is not written down in a book where you can open the book and say, it says this. The law, at least in um, the United States, and I presume is true in Canada, there are things written down in a book. And then there's case law that interprets what those words in the book say. And the case law, we alluded to this earlier, the case law is comprised of one and a half to two and a half percent of all cases who were so high conflict that um, they couldn't settle. And so the law is comprised of extreme cases of incredibly complicated either fact scenarios or legal scenarios that couldn't settle. So we have to remember that when we're thinking about following the law in this context, the law is made up of extreme cases, number one. Number two, the reason that lawyers have jobs is because a lawyer can say to one person in the same fact scenario, I can get you X, and the other lawyer says, I can get you Y. We should fight about it. So it's not always clear what would happen. But more importantly, and this is really where I'm getting to, at least in mediation, we talk about the law as being you go to your consulting attorney to give you a prediction of what they think might happen if you were in court. And along with that prediction should come an explanation of the process, how you get what that prediction is, you know, what papers need to be filed, how it has to happen, how much it will cost, how long it will take, and what will happen to the other person and the other spouse and the children while this process is happening. Um, so that, to me, is what the law is in mediation. And then the question is, we use different matrices to decide things in our life. In the context of divorce, the law is but one element of decision-making matrices. It's the law, it's your sense of fairness, and we like to refer to fairness as the F word of divorce because there's you know, fairness to mom, fairness to dad, those could be different. Um, and then there's agreements that may have been made during the marriage, either de facto agreements or contractual agreements. So. To me, it's important that when people are contemplating get, getting divorced, that they have a really informed 
thoughtful either personal session or with in front of the other with the help of a facilitator like me about what the role of the law is in their process. That was a long answer, but that's what I think. But I can see that from that long answer, I could talk to you for hours. So we're definitely going to have to have you back onto our show. It would be my sure. pleasure. Um, any parting thoughts? Like, what do you think, what is it that you want people to understand about not even mediation, but divorce? You know, the society, what, what do you think society's view of, of the event of a divorce is and how should it be? You, you, you somehow be, you keep hitting my very passionate points. Um, <laughs> so... I think I'm going to answer the, the, it's a really a two part question. One is, you know, what, how should we view the event of divorce as a society or how do I think we should view it? One. And the second part of the question is how should, um, how should people going through it view it? Um, and I think we should start viewing divorce, not as the failure of a family or as of a marriage, but as the restructuring of a family the physical, emotional, and financial restructuring of a family. When a company restructures, we don't say, oh, the company failed. We say the company restructured. And it's time to start thinking of divorce as the restructuring of the family unit to support co-parenting, or in the case of ex-spouses, to recraft that relationship as an ex-spouse relationship and restructure that relationship, that it's not um, an embarrassing shameful failure. And part of the, 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 the reason that we view it as this shameful, horrible failure is because of the process that we put people through to get divorced. We call it, it's a verb. You get divorced. To get divorced is, is horrendous. And so the associated feelings with it are, you know, terrible, number one. Um, and number two, I think that we... I think that divorce is a family matter with a legal element. It's not, um, it's not a lawsuit that happens to be about a family. And until we start realizing that divorce, the solutions to divorce are complicated and they're multidiscipline. There's psychological support that's needed, financial, tax, legal. Um, and to start letting people know that it's okay to ask for help. Um, more broadly, my biggest message to people is that as you go about getting divorced, you have choices. There are process choices that are available to you. You don't have to engage in a litigation. Um, and the way that I would assess what's right for you as a family or as a couple or not is um, a risk-based analysis. What are the risks of failing at litigation or succeeding at litigation? And what are the risks of trying and failing at mediation or collaborative? So I think that the concept that there's choices out there is not known to enough people and we hopefully with shows like yours you know that word will get out well on that note i think that you really helped us understand mediation different perspectives a totally different understanding of what a really good mediator is and boy if i was going through mediation kara i'd want you on my side I would well, want you as my I mediator. wouldn't be on your side. I'd be on your side. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. And I want, and yes, you're absolutely right. I phrased that wrong. So thank you so much for thank speaking you with Steve and I today. Thanks. This is my pleasure. All right, Debbie, you and I can do the wrap after. Yeah. So what? Now that's what I call a mediator. That was awesome. I told wow. you, like, you know, I've done a lot of shows on uh, various dispute resolutions, you know, ADR, alternative dispute resolutions. And when I met Kara via the um, internet, you know, we've had several conversations about mediation and divorce and I really liked her outlook. I, and, and so I thought, this is a woman that I have to speak to. Like, this is someone who's got a great message to share with the public. Mm -hmm. I'm so glad she right. was on. She did not disappoint. Not at all. And how do we get a hold of her? Well, you could go to her website, which is srmediators.com. srmediators.com. And just a minute. Oh, my goodness. Okay, can you just pause for a second? But let me get her, web, her email address. Uh, where am I here? Just a second. Oh, I'm not going to give you... It's a yahoo.com. I don't know if that's that's her... Um, Just give the website. 
notes and yeah. they'll be able to link through there. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. So how do so we get a, so how do we get a hold of her? Kara's firm is Stalder S T A L D E R R A I C H R A I C E R A I C H. Let's do that. So go to, Let's do it one more time. So how do we get a hold of her? Google her website, Stalder Rage, S T A L D E R R A I C H. So it's www.srmediators.com or call 212-230-9880. Sorry, 212-230-9880. And you can get a hold of Kara. All right, great. Another great show, Deborah. Thank you so much. I look forward to your next program on the Smart Divorce. Thanks. It was such a pleasure, wasn't it? Great it was today great to show. hear how positive mediation can be. Mm-hmm. Have a good day. As always, I hope the program helped you. If you have a comment or question you'd like to ask us, we'd love to hear from you. You can leave us a voicemail on our listener line at area code 248-686-2256. Or drop us an email with your question or comment to divorcesourceradio at gmail.com. New programs are available every week on divorcesourceradio.com as well as iTunes, BlackBerry, Stitcher, and all over the web. If you'd like to be notified when new programs are available, you can follow us on Twitter. Our follow word is Divorce Source. Also, if you're not listening from our website, I invite you to stop by DivorceSourceRadio.com where you'll find a complete program archive. If you're looking for a specific subject, simply type it into our search engine and chances are you'll find what you're looking for. We also have other resources available at our website as well. And while you're on our website, click on the Facebook icon and join the growing Divorce Source Radio Facebook community. Thanks for listening. Until next time, make it a great week and stay healthy. I'm Steve Peck.